And start here and now. Uh, we'll talk today, we'll start the whole course uh, with giving a, an account of uh, the so-called new cosmology. Uh, and uh, here I have made some uh, fly sheet for you. You can follow that fly sheet. I have given some very, very detail of my whole lecture, very, very detailed PowerPoint. You cannot read that, so that you can just as well give up. But you can, of course, follow my headlines. And then uh, I also point to some uh, diagrams and tables and so on as I go on. But uh, if you want to follow the lecture in writing, then you can follow here in the, in the fly sheets. Uh, so uh, we uh, yeah we will talk uh, uh, on different aspects uh, that is uh, that are present also in uh, Hawking's books. Uh, first, I will start by by talking about the um, uh, the history the history of the universe. Uh, this is a, a subject that uh, mankind have been thinking about for, for thousands of years. Uh, what the, what the, how to understand our world uh, and uh, uh, the world around us. And uh, let me give an even briefer history of the universe than, than Hawking himself. And uh, what we what we know that uh, sort of we know many there are many many different stories, mythological stories, and narratives about the universe wherever one comes. But uh, but one of the that has been important for for Western thinking is is of course this well known idea, uh, original Babylonian, that the Earth is like a flat plate. And then uh, surrounding that flat plate, we have a dome, uh, the dome of the sky, where the different of the celestial bodies are attached, the sun, the stars, and the moons, and so on. And that gives us, uh, in the imagination from, of that time, of course, a very, very small universe. Uh, we see it on the picture there. Uh, a man who is uh, living on a flat earth, and then he is, uh, has reached the border, uh, boundary, and then he is uh, taking a look at what is on the other side. And uh, the drawing assumes that if he goes any further, then he falls down. What is on the other side, there is no, no one who, who knows. Uh, so uh, so this is, this is the, the most uh, simple uh, image of the universe uh, that we, we, we sort of will deal with here. Uh, and uh, it is uh, simple, and it is also it was also self-evident because uh, it is somehow uh, evidenced by by experience. We we, we uh, live uh, of something that at least looks flat, and we also know that we we don't fall off. Uh, we also know that uh, that the heavenly bodies they are like uh, uh, circulating. Uh, in half circles uh, uh, around the sky, on the sky, uh, from morning to dust. So in that sense, it, it, it is, uh, it is uh, verified by, by experience as far as, as they could know. And it's also a self-evident image that, that held on as long as, way, way into the Middle Ages and, and, and the Renaissance. Uh, for the learned people, it was not good enough, and uh, they uh, they could see that it was inconsistent with other experiences they had. And uh, so, one of the simple experiences one can one had was that uh, a, a ship that was traveling towards the horizon uh, would uh, would disappear under the horizon line gradually, so only the topsail would be visible at the end. And that uh, had to indicate that it, uh, the Earth could not be completely flat. It had to have curvature. Uh, uh, navigating sea seafaring uh, nations, like for example the Greeks, they also noticed that when they were uh, navigating by the North Star, then the North Star was not st situated stationary on, on the sky. It was uh, as if it was rising above the horizon the further north they traveled. And that can also only be explained uh, if, if you uh, assume uh, curvature 
and not uh, flatness. So, uh, so the learned people, they, and they set up different experiments, and they figured out actually to measure both the, the circumference uh, of the Earth and, and other things. Uh, so they, they uh, went quite quickly, the Egyptians and the uh, ancient Greeks, from the idea of a flat Earth to, to a spherical Earth. Uh, that uh, they uh, they still regarded Earth, of course, as the center of of the universe, and uh, they took for granted that uh, there were different objects that were orbiting Earth, and they uh, they evolved revolved uh, around Earth in in circles, and indeed perfect circles. They had a dogma about uh, what was the most perfect uh, geometrical form, and that was to their mind uh, the circle. So uh, celestial bodies, they were sort of almost uh, obliged to orbit Earth in, in perfect circles. Uh, so on these assumptions, Ptolemy, he came up with a model that was extremely successful for, for thousands of years, uh, this is a well-known model where we have Earth in the center, and then we have uh, the different spheres orbiting Earth, eight, he counted, of them, where the inner sphere is, is occupied by the moon. Then we have the sun at the fourth sphere, and then the fixed star as the boundary. So it was a, sort of a, like an onion. You, could, uh, you had a, a middle, and then you could layer by layer ascend into the boundary, so that was the fixed stars. And then again, we had a problem, what was outside? Uh, and this nobody asked about, but, but one could at least assume, when, uh, when Christianity came in, one could assume that that would be the space for, for God and, and heavens and maybe hell. Uh, so, uh, so this was, uh, there is two, two renditions here. We have, uh, we have this rendition. This is, uh, I think, a late Renaissance, uh, Renaissance uh, drawing. And here we, n not only is Earth in the, in the center, it's also huge, which indicates its significance. Here we have a more formal model. Uh, so this is a, a successful model. It was a model that was taken, was to, uh, taken over by, by the Christians, when they, the Christianity became the, the official religion in, in Europe, because it answered many, many questions, uh, uh, or many dogmas of Christianity. It's, uh, it was, uh, it, the model was simple, and it was perfect. Uh, as, as humans, we were appropriately located at the center of this universe, as uh, God's most perfect creation. Uh, this circle was maintained as a perfect form, and God would, of course, always create a universe in the most, most perfect uh, appearances. And then uh, the boundary problem was maybe not a problem any longer because that gave us enough space for, for heaven and, and hell. So it was a model that, uh, that appealed to to the theologians, and it was so appealing that it became uh, became th heretical to, to question it. It was not a model without without problems. Uh, the learned people, or the so-called uh, natural philosophers of the day, they observed, uh, of course, the heavens, and they saw problems that didn't uh, that didn't uh, match with the model. For example, that there were some uh, bodies, celestial bodies, that didn't bodies that didn't. Uh, move perfectly on the heavens. They moved uh, to and fro and in zigzag and in other strange movements that could not be explained by perfect circles. Uh, so, uh, so one had to do something to, to Ptolemy's model to, to, to maintain this perfect circle dogma. And that one did by adding to the original circle here, orbiting around Earth, a so-called Epi circle. So Jupiter would, for example, uh, uh, move in an epi circle around a circle that was orbiting Earth. 
In that sense, you could have a Jupiter that, that sometimes uh, moved, uh, from our, our observation point, sometimes moved uh, to the right and sometimes to the left, depending on, and we are observing from here, so sometimes it'll move this way, and sometimes it will move this way. So, uh, and you can organize by, by, by inserting these different EPI circles, uh, almost all movements in the sky, depending on, on how ma many EPI circles you needed to do the job, how, what speed they were supposed to have, what uh, radius they were supposed to have, and so on and so forth. So one could, uh, according to, one could adjust uh, uh, the observable facts, the observable planets, to the dogma, uh, maintain the dogma of the perfect circle. Uh, it was uh, from the, in the beginning, if it was an elegant model, it was not an elegant model any longer. The more uh, bodies one, one was observing on the, on the heaven because it became extremely complex to set them up in these catalogs. One now had to, to keep track on of EPI circles and EPI circles and speeds and whatnot you had to keep track on. And it was as if that, uh, that uh, every, every body ha uh, observed on the heaven had its own unique explanation. And this is, of course, not science any longer then. Uh, now you, you instead, instead of a, a scientific, uh, a general uh, explanation, you have some convoluted catalogs you have to look up in order to find uh, the movements for, for different unique uh, uh, celestial bodies. Uh, so it was uh, one of the reasons why Copernicus came around and, and reorganized the whole idea. And instead of having the old geocentric model Earth in the center, he suggested that everything would look much better and simpler if you put the sun in the center and then we had this so-called helio heliocentric universe, Earth now orbiting uh, only in the third sphere here uh, with the moon uh, orbiting around Earth. So that, began, that was of course a, a, at these days heretic and he, he, he wrote in in Latin and, and encrypted his, his writings so as not to offend uh, the official uh, version. And uh, later on came, came Kepler and he destroyed another thing. He destroyed the idea of the perfect circles because he noticed that uh, the, the, the movements were, were basi basically elliptical. Uh, so, uh, but it was the start of that uh, solar system we know today uh, and uh, this, this was, uh, is of course, that, that idea that we understand and we, we see today. Uh, another thing I'll just mention, something that when we talk about the universe that is uh, basically incomprehensible for our, our mind is, is to understand the distances. Uh, uh, here we see again, uh, as we look at history, that uh, our, our concept of the universe, our image of the universe, it has been expanding from, from Babylonian times up to today. Uh, the, the universe expands in actuality. We know that now, but uh, it's, uh, it has also expanded in our imagination from, from the first uh, little uh, universe we had there in form of a flat, flat Earth, and then we had a dome dome on, on top and then uh, f we f they figure out that we, there is a solar system and, and thereupon they figure out that there are many solar systems and they make up a so-called galaxy. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, astronomers, they started then to speculate uh, of the, on the existence of other galaxies. So now there's not just one galaxy but, but many. And today we, uh, we know uh, that uh, our visible universe consists of around uh, one, 100, billion, 100 billion galaxies. And that we know furthermore uh, make only up what we call the observable universe. And since that is only the little part we can observe, we know therefore that the universe is much, much bigger than and cutting edge astronomers, they, they speculate very seriously that we are perhaps not even the, the only universe, but there are many, many universes. Uh, so we don't live actually in a uni, uh, one, uh, one worse universe, but in a multiverse, 
uh, uh, that we cannot know or of, but uh, but uh, seems to be a, an, 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 an a hypothesis. So uh, so we have expanded this idea to, to extremely now. Uh, we, uh, we also need to, to measure distances very differently from, from what we had before. And we cannot measure in kilometers, miles, or so on. But now we, we measure in light years. Uh, and that is the distance that is traveled by light in one year. That is a light year. Uh, in, we have, we have the, the, our, neighbor, our neighbor star, that one closest to us, uh, it, uh, for, it takes... Uh, four years for light to travel from that neighbor star to us. So we will say, we say therefore that it has a distance of four light years from us. Uh, and here we see what is sort of a, a kind, uh, quite typical illustration of, of our solar system here. Uh, we are here, third planet, and then uh, the planets down to they have Pluto included here. Uh, and that illustration is, of course, misleading because the illustrator, he doesn't have enough space to actually give a good uh, sense of the scale that is between, between the sun and then the planets orbiting. Uh, if the sun, if we were that close to the sun, we would be fried very, very quickly. Uh, but the, 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 the more realistic scale would be that we, we should look at the sun as maybe a, an, a, an orange and the Earth as a pinhead, and then we should move the pinhead 15 meters away from that orange. So somewhere down there, I guess. That would be the realistic scale for, of, of that. Uh, we live in a galaxy, and uh, there, there we have also a place here. We live in one of the arms of the galaxy here at the outskirts. Uh, and uh, and uh, this galaxy is in itself huge. It's across, its distance across is 100,000 light years. This means 10,000 light years, this distance they have measured up here. So about uh, 100,000 across. Uh, and there is in itself approximately stars, one billion stars in, in that galaxy. So, and we live here. So, uh, we have no way to, to communicate to, to other, other stars here. The, the distances are now too, too, uh, too vast. Uh, when we have these enormous numbers, we have one, mil, one billion uh, solar systems in our galaxy and one billion galaxies in the uni observable universe and so on and so forth. Then astronomers today, they think it's likely, since we have such a huge number, that there is actually life, maybe also intelligent life uh, on other planets. But it is uh, uh, irrelevant because we cannot travel. We cannot travel these distances. Uh, so uh, so if, uh, there's no way, as we, we can see it today, uh, to, to overcome that obstacle. Uh, so uh, this is our, our situation here. And we can see, to give you an even better idea of the enormous distances we are talking about, here we have our galaxies. That was 100,000 light years across. We cannot travel these 100,000 light years, but if we projected into our nearest local group, then it disappears as a spot. If we take that local group here and project that into our nearest so-called supercluster, then that disappears as a spot. And there are many superclusters too. So, uh, so we are situated in a universe that's enormous. On this scale here, you can begin to see the structure of the universe. A spider's web, almost. And this structure is always the same. Wherever you look, you will see the same. There's no difference. Uh, it is, uh, uh, of course, the same on a, on a large scale. Uh, when we zoom in, then it's not the same any longer. But on that large scale, it's all the same uh, web. So, so in that sense, the universe is homogeneous. And it's a little bit of a mystery in modern physics. 
uh, why uh, why it, it is modern astronomy, why it is that the, the universe is so homogeneous. Uh, so uh, here we have a picture. Uh, that is actually something we can see. We can go to the southern sky somewhere, and then we can actually look into our universe, the core of, of our galaxy, and then you see this lighted up core here of uh, of of the of the sky. Uh, so so much we can we can see from our Earth with the naked eye. Uh, there is a there is a, since they, since uh, it takes time for for light to travel, some paradoxes come around that are interested in them, interesting in themselves. Light uh, travels with an with a certain speed, and it's in uh, it is uh, invariable. Uh, it takes uh, let's say a million uh, three. 0.3 seconds to travel 1 million kilometers. So uh, light travels uh, with a speed of around 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, from our perspective, enormous, but uh, on a cosmological scale, it's a little slow. Uh, that means that the sun we see coming from us from other solar systems or galaxies have been a, a, a time on the way. They are, we are seeing it with a delay. We, are, we, are, we cannot see the now, the presence in, in the, of the now in, in uh, the universe. The sun that, uh, that shines now, that emits its, its, its sun rays now, uh, will be uh, eight lime light minutes about the arriving Earth now. So it will take in eight minutes for us to see it. Hawking, he makes up some kind of a model for the fun of it. And he sort of suggests to himself that we have the sun here and emits light here in, in that uh, triangular form here. The diagonal line is then the speed of light. And then we are on time zero. It emits certain light and we are here, Earth, at a certain distance of the soil, of, 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 the, of the sun. At that point, we are in the so-called elsewhere. There's no way we can communicate with the sun at this point, zero. So we don't know what's going on on the sun right now. Then he imagines that the, the sun simply implodes, goes dark at time zero. Uh, that doesn't affect us in that po uh, at that point of time. So we will be unaware and ignorant and go on living as we have lived until, of course, the time ticks and we enter eventually the light cone of the sun. Then we will find out that everything has gone dark. And then, uh, then the, the sun has disappeared on, on the sky. Uh, so we have eight minutes here to live before we, we discover that one. And the sun is close by in, uh, in cosmological uh, terms. Whenever we look at something uh, with our telescopes, we look at something, not something that is just eight light minutes away, but typically something that are millions of light years away, uh, or billions. So we look into the past uh, when we see, and the universe that arrives to us uh, uh, arrives from the past. Uh, and that is what uh, this uh, illustration, the light cone, is attempting to to illustrate, here we have the us, we are observers here, and then we look, if we look into the, into the universe, we cannot see what is next to us on the so-called hypersurface of the present. That we don't know, and there's no way we can know it. We can only see what arrives to us from the past light cone. And the deeper down we see, the older universe we see. Uh, our modern telescopes, these Hub Hubble men, uh, telescope, for example, it can see it back to around to tw 12, billion, 12 billion light years. So it sees 12 billion uh, light that is emitted 12 billion years ago. That means a universe that's just about forming, where there is just about the beginning some uh, galaxy formation. Uh, so a very young uh, universe. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, our 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 limit 
The same thing if we are sending out uh, a light uh, or a radio wave, for example, it travels with the same speed of light. A radio wave, it will not be picked up by anybody here in our near neighborhood now. It will maybe millions of years from now be picked up. And then, of course, they have to send a message back. That will take another million of years. So there's a slow communication. So, so we, the, the, we, are, we are sort of limited by, by the speed of light. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, light is, is, is a very, very slow means of communication. Uh, so uh, then I will uh, begin to explain why is it. We, it, is, it is now known, it is, it is a relatively new idea, but we know now that, that the universe is expanding this is new knowledge. This was not at all the idea of just going 100 years back. 100 years back, people, they would think it was probably per permanent or stationary. Uh, so, uh, but now this is not the idea. Now it's dynamic and expanding it. It's certainly expanding from a certain point. We'll talk about that. But how, how come, come that they know that? One of the means to know it is to know something before, something that was discovered already in the 18th century. 18th and 19th century. And that is something called uh, the double effect. This is something we know from uh, especially sound. We know that uh, if something, an object is moving towards us, then we know that the pitch is increasing in sound. And we can hear that it is moving towards us because uh, the sound waves, they are compressed. We use it when we are uh, crossing the street, for example. And when it's uh, moving away from us, the other way around, the sound waves are, are stretched out, and we can hear that as a decrease in pitch. So we know that uh, quite well from, from just common experience. Uh, the same is, uh, is the case with light. Uh, something that, uh, uh, that is moving towards us uh, is, uh, is increased in light, it's, it's shifted. The spectrum of the light is shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. And if it's moving away from us, it, the light is also shifted, or the spectrum of the light is now shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. All light has a spectrum. This is this, a red end and a blue end and a purple end here at the very end. Uh, so, so uh, and you can see uh, shifts red or blue shifts because spectrums, they also reveal certain chemicals that's, that are emitted from the object that sends out the light. Uh, if there is an object that sends out uh, a, a sun that sends out a certain spectrum uh, a, a light, then you can see if it contains helium, uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, carbon, whatever you have. And this, this, this gives off these kind of patterns here and, and chemistry chemistry and chemists and, and uh, physicists, they can read that quite quickly. So they know how they are supposed to look like in labor laboratory conditions. But if they, we, we have some, some, we get some light from a distant galaxy, then light, they can be, we can then easily detect if it is shifted. We know the normal condition, and then we can easily detect here something that is shifted. The pattern is shifted towards the red end so we know that this galaxy must be moving away from us. This is a doubler effect in light now. As it can also be moving towards, then it would be shifted towards the blue end of scale. It will, the arrows would go down instead of up here. So, uh, so, so, so moving objects, they can be either blue shifted or they can be red shifted. And this was an important, uh, important tool, theoretical tool that that one of the, the important uh, physicists, astronomers, used uh, Edwin Hubble. He used it in the beginning of, of the century, 1929. He, had a, he got access to some new type of uh, telescopes in California, and then he wanted to, to, to observe uh, distant galaxies. Uh, and um, he thought like everybody else thought that uh, he, would, uh, he, could, he would read, of course, uh, the red and the blue shifts of these galaxies, and, and he thought that it would probably be more or less an equal distribution. 
Some of them, they would move uh, away, away from us. Some of them would uh, move towards us. Uh, so, so he expected that since the universe was supposed to be static and permanent, that would be more or less 50-50. Uh, and he took, of course, down his data and so on and so on and so on. And then he, he discovered to his great surprise that everything was redshifted. So all the distant galaxies he was observed, they were redshifted. And that could only mean one thing, namely that they were moving away. And that gave sort of the beginning to, to the knowledge we have today. The universe is, is expanding and not, uh, not stationary. Uh, and he could also figure out more. He could also see, uh, figure out uh, with what speed the universe was expanding. He could figure out that uh, galaxies that was nearby, they were expanding with a lower speed than galaxies that were far, uh, far away. So the, the farther out he looked in the universe, the, the faster they were re receding. Uh, the recession speed was, uh, was last, the velocity kilometer per second was, uh, was last, uh, larger here. So, uh, so this was something he could, uh, he could understand. This uh, the simple model here is, there is a x axis for distance and then there is a y-axis for speed or for velocity. Uh, and then he, he plotted this, this diagonal here because there, there was a, a proportional uh, coincidence between uh, distance and uh, speed. That's what we have here. Uh, there was a, they were, they were expanded, the, the, the proportion between uh, distance and velocity was a constant, namely 72 kilometers per second per something they call megaparsecs, a measuring unit. And that means that uh, if, you, if you look at an object that is uh, these 100 megaparsecs away from us, it expands with the speed, or it recedes with a speed of around 7,000 7, kilometers per second. Double the distance, double the speed, around 14,000 kilometers per second. Triple the distance, 300 megaparsecs. Triple the speed, around 21,000 kilometers per second. So out here, the, exp uh, the expansion uh, speed is enormous uh, of our universe. Uh, so uh, so this, is, this is what, uh, what is now understood. It is understood, for example, in this model here. Everybody gives us this model here. It's sometimes a balloon and sometimes a, a raisin bread. Here is a raisin bread. Uh, we assume we assume we sit here in the observation point, one raisin, and then we have a, a galaxy nearby that is five centimeters from us, and a f more distant galaxy ten centimeters from us. Then we let go one second. And then we see how much did they expand. The nearby galaxy had expanded to 10 centimeters, the farther one to 20 centimeters. So in the same time, this one expanded 5 centimeters, this one 10 centimeters. So an expansion speed twice, uh, twice the one of the, uh, the, the nearby galaxy. So that shows uh, sort of in a, in a relaxed uh, cartoon way, uh, the same principle. Uh, so, uh, and then everything is, is looking, of course. That is deceptive, of course, but it is looking as if it's, 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 it's expanding away from us. It looks as if we again now are the center of the universe, then everything is just escaping away from us as if there's something really wrong about earthlings. Uh, and that's an illusion because everything is the same in the universe. There's no point, there's no fixed point where from something ex recedes or expands. Uh, if, we, if our observation point is A, everything escapes from A with the same uh, with Hubble's law, according to Hubble's flow, 
But if our observation point is B, you'll see exactly the same thing. Uh, so there's, there's, there's no observation point that is uh, more important than any other observation point. Every observation point would show us exactly the same thing, exactly the same, the same uh, Hubble constant, the same uh, Hubble flow. When you know all this, then you also, it's easy to understand that an expanding universe must necessarily have a beginning. This is simple, simple enough. If we look at this universe as Hubble do, and he can see that it is expanding, then you can, you, it must of course have been smaller if we go five billion years back. It expands with a certain rate that can be measured. So you just measure how much smaller it must have been five billion years ago. And if you go even further back, 10 billion years ago, then it must have been smaller indeed still. Not only smaller, but also denser and also brighter. So. Uh, so we, mo we can go back from the universe as we have, we can calculate, uh, calibrate <coughs> how much, uh, how, wh what was the universe uh, five billion years ago, uh, 10 billion years ago, and then you can finally suggest, well, it must have had a beginning. This is what uh, was, is then sometimes called a singularity, and today it's better known as the Big Bang. It was uh, actually meant to, to mock the Big Bang theoreticians because this was a new theory, and those who were uh, in advocating the, the stationary universe, they, as a, as a scorn, they, they called the other expanding theorists for Big Bang theorists. And then these, stationary, these expanding theorists, they thought it was so funny that they used it themselves. So, uh, so we, we, we it expands from a, from a point, a kind of a seed universe, and then there is a lot of research going on, of course, in order to try to understand what that is. And uh, that is a, a, a contentious issue, and, and here we, we don't have anything conclusive at all. Uh, what is a singularity? What is Big Bang? What happens there in the Big Bang? One can go pretty close back, uh, f pretty much, Way back, one can, we can go as, as, as uh, we can uh, imitate conditions by these uh, new uh, super colliders that are building here and there. Im imitate conditions that were around in, in maybe fractions of seconds after the Big Bang. But the Big Bang itself, uh, nobody is very clear about. One seems to be clear about that, that it is not expanding in exactly this kind of linear way. Uh, because it, it must have been expanding rather, and this was, I'll not use this one here, rather, as my front page said, in some kind of an inf inflationary expansion. One uh, assume that, so, that it inflated first, super, super fast, so a seed became the billions and billions of billions of uh, seeds of the same, and it had to be the same because otherwise we would have different physical laws in the universe, that doesn't work, or different uh, 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 forces in the universe, that doesn't work. So something had to be uh, the same in the beginning. Uh, so so the, the idea is that there is this inflationary state first and then it expands. And then uh, one would also think that maybe it expands and then 20 years ago one thought, uh, well, since the universe has been expanding and, and now they, they, they calculate about 14 billion years, it will probably retract again. This is sort of what we get if the, there is a big bang, then intuitively we think that a big bang will slow down. And then it will sort of crush in, uh, collapse in, <coughs> around itself, and that was then popularly called the big crunch. If there were a big bang here, there were probably a big crunch there at the end of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, and that idea uh, has now been disproven. Uh, this is not uh, the end of our universe. Ba basically, our universe have no end, uh, you could say. 
the expansion, instead of slowing down, as you would think intuitively it should, it actually accelerates. Uh, so the expansion will become faster and faster, and depending how fast it'll be, nobody seems to know. Uh, depending on, on how fast it'll be, it'll begin to rip itself apart. So, so the universe will rip itself apart, everything will rip itself apart, even atoms will rip it themselves apart, and it'll end in absolutely nothing. One, uh, one vast, dark, cold emptiness. That is the modern theory. Does it end in fire or in cold? They once asked in, in mythology, and today you will say cold, in a deep freeze. Uh, this is uh, some of the models that have been around. The, the, the big crunch, that was the idea about something would expand to a combination point, then will collapse upon, upon itself. Maybe it, uh, they suggest it would just find some kind of an equilibrium and uh, we'll just stand there and uh, don't do it, doesn't, uh, neither expand nor, nor collapse. Uh, and then there was, uh, there is the new one here. It expands with still accelerating speed and uh, eventually ripping itself apart. Uh, the last thing I will talk about is this so-called anthropic principle. It's, sort of, it's more philosophical. Uh, it, 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 uh, it involves the whole idea about is there a designer or no designer of the universe. It's sort of a re uh, repetition of a debate that is also in biology, it's an origin of life or a designer for life or no. Uh, it, it starts by the observation that when we read these parameters, when we determine these uh, parameters in the universe, we have very fine-tuned, it looks like fine-tuned numbers for, for example, the force of gravity. There we have a number, electromagnetism, so on, so on. The proton, the mass of the proton, we seem to... Uh, compared to the neutron is uh, 0 0.9984. There we have a number that seems extremely fine-tuned. Uh, we know, we call the total mass in the universe for omega total, uh, omega total, and that should, must be one. It cannot be a little less than one, because if it's less than one, if the total mass is less than one, then uh, the universe uh, will expand too fast to, be, to, 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 form, uh, to form galaxies. It will sort of overcome the gravitational forces, and then we would not be here. But if it's much higher than one, then uh, it would recollapse before we have any galaxy formation and we would not be here. So it has the balance there very, very finely on this number we call one. So this implies that the universe seems to be fine-tuned. And if it's fine-tuned, we want to find the fine-tuner, and that is usually God. Uh, so we have a designer uh, uh, of, of the universe that fine-tunes things so finely. Uh, it's, uh, so, so the argument here is, is a pro-designer pro -designer, uh, argument. It's a pro-God argument. Then we have, uh, we have uh, the opposite. That's Hawking's position. Is that there is uh, actually, there's no designer. Uh, these so-called numbers, we have, of course, measured certain things. We know we, if we determine the, the mass of, uh, of the proton, for example, and it looks very, very fine-tuned, and if it were a little different, there would be no pro uh, atoms, and we would not be here, and so on and so forth, then we are, of course, measuring something that's already there as part of us uh, in our mathematical language. Uh, so, uh, so we should not even ask the question of is there a designer for that kind of thing. We, we should not uh, wonder 
why we are living in a so-called friendly universe that seems to be fine-tuned. Because if we are not living in that fine-tuned, friendly universe, we would not be here to ask the question. So, uh, so we are part of an evolutionary process, of course. Uh, we are part of a, a universe that has evolved and where we are the end product of that evolution, uh, but very really clearly an end product because we, we are part of that universe since we are atoms, since we are composed of atoms and, and molecules and, and subatomic par particles and so on and so forth. So the universe has given that these conditions to, to foster some, something like us creative human beings that have been so intelligent and, in, and developed so uh, sophisticated languages that we, could we can put numbers of some of these, these, uh, these uh, entities here. So that makes uh, Hawking say, he introduces the anthropic principle. We see the universe we see the way it is because we exist. Or he says here, why is the universe the way we see it? The answer is simple. If it had been different, we would not be here. Uh, so uh, so if, uh, if it has been different, if it had been not friendly, not fine-tuned, but chaotic, uh, then we would not be here as being to, beings to ask questions. A little uh, variation of that, uh, that uh, anthropic principle, he, they dis Hawking distinguished between a weak and a strong. The so-called strong is, I can only say it's a variation of the weak actually, but anyways, uh, the strong says uh, that, uh, that we live in, uh, in one universe out of a multitude of, of universes, where some of them are, are friendly to life or where life can, uh, can uh, evolve and some not. We live something here that, that, can, uh, that, can, be, that can support life other universes may consist only of black holes or no matter or strange space-time combinations. And once in a while, there will be another universe that can also support life. So we live here and uh, in our friendly universe. And uh, we live here because we have evolved in, in that friendly universe. This is uh, the idea of the anthropic principle. Uh, so there are these two fu sort of fundamental answers to the question, why do we live in such a friendly universe? You can say God, or you can say it must be so, because otherwise we could not ask the question. Another uh, variation of the idea is that we live in a, in a, in a universe where there exactly uh, three space dimension and uh, one time dimension. It cannot be different because if there are two time dimensions, then we can walk uh, forth and back in time and change things, and that would be chaotic. If there were only two space dimensions, it would also be cha chaotic because we could not move around. Uh, and then all kinds of other combinations that uh, is difficult to imagine. So we live in this smiley here, and uh, if it had been different, there would be no smiley and no us. So that's, uh, that's uh, how I see this, uh, this debate that has been around for, for a long time between the design argument and, uh, and anthropic, anthropic argument. Uh, yes, that is actually what I have to say here. <laughs>